So uh, let's start the afternoon uh, session. The first presentation uh, title is Learning Barrier to Chip Design Using Open FA SOC. The speaker is Mr. Mehdi Saringane there. So he graduated at the I call Polytechnic in France and I took uh, MSD and PhD in France. So uh, he, he joined the uh, University of Michigan uh, Integrated Circuit Laboratory as a uh, researcher in 2015. And he has been a senior uh, researcher since 2019, working on synthesizable analog circuits and automating SOC synthesis. He is currently a visiting scholar in the Department of the Computer Science and Engineering at the University of California, San Diego, USA, and a design advisor for the Open Broad project. His research uh, interest uh, include uh, variability, trend design, digital design of near below threshold energy efficient systems and uh, adoption techniques for automation. The presentation is uh, 20 minutes long, plus 210 minutes. So, so we just start. All right. So <clears throat> today my presentation is going to be about OpenFA SOC, which stands for Open Source uh, Fully Autonomous uh, uh, SOC. And I'll be talking about the origin of FA SOC and how it evolved uh, into uh, the open source world. First of all, this is my group. Um, I have a postdoc, Dr. Roshan Hukai. He's uh, from KAIST, and he's going to be working on the service design. Min Hong is an EDA guy from Taiwan, NTU. Uh, he works, he joined us as a PhD student, and he's working on uh, EDA tooling and uh, root of trust and security. And Hong Lee is working on analog, high speed analog design. Ki Hor um, is working for AMD, uh, but he's currently working with us on the root of trust. And we have a couple MS and undergrad students. Um, and visiting researcher, one of them is from Japan from Tokyo Institute. He's currently in Michigan working with us on a tape out in Intel 16. Um, so first, I think it's worthwhile explaining what is FASOC and where it came from. Uh, this is a DARPA-funded program. It's called IDEA. There was a couple projects, Open Road, which is pretty famous, and we were the design uh, advisors in that project. FASOC is uh, a project led by Michigan in collaboration with Virginia and ARM and we worked on synthesizing or making available um, um, a, um, SOC or low power SOC with all its building blocks. There's a couple talks from Professor Wenslov uh, on Chips Alliance and I have my own talk as well. Um, also chairing the, the analog working group in Chips Alliance, so feel free to join it and attend our Tuesday meeting. It's uh, once a month. Uh, over the course of the program, we taped out a couple of chips. Uh, so we wanted to demonstrate that um, automation in analog is possible, and we are using a cell-based approach. So we did the first tape out in TSMC 65 LP with all these blocks here that are listed: LDOs, PLL, SAM sensor, etc. And it was successfully dis demonstrated in Salt Lake City at the ERI summit. Uh, we, we did an AVS or DVFS scheme, and we showed all the, the ARM core working with everything with scaling the voltage. Then we started uh, working on a FinFET technology, which is GF12, uh, Global Foundry technology. Um, and we started doing more blocks, like the DC-DC converter, uh, the BLE, and a couple variants of the LDO and the ADCs. And as we, as we went forward, we started taping out in the open source shuttles, and I'll get to that as we go. Um, so, OpenFA SOC is the open source, fully open source version of FA SOC, and this is how it evolved. Google showed a, really, uh, a real interest in FA SOC, and we wanted to use our framework 
uh, using the open source tools, but also the, uh, the open source PDK. So uh, we are under the umbrella of Chips Alliance, Linux Foundation, Google, and we're also funded by NIST um, recently. So we're working on test structures for cryogenic temperature um, uh, modeling. So I'll get to that later in my presentation. So how does it work, uh, and how does it compare to traditional analog layout? Um, I'll try to explain that uh, in a simple way. I made a simple diagram here, which compares the traditional analog work workflow. It starts with schematic entry, simulation layout, then you find the problem, you go back, you change your layout, your, schem or your schematic, and it's a very, very time-consuming uh, process. In our case, what we do is we offer to use the very log uh, as a description of the analog block we want, and we, we shoehorn it to the digital flow or grid-based flow, which is highly automated in any PDK. So that's ba the basic idea. And we're using, I think you heard it a couple times now, we're using a cell-based approach. And what does that mean? So if, now if you have a very local description of a block, we identify a couple analog functions, and I tried to highlight them in, in blue here. Uh, and basically, there are a simple 12 transistor below uh, uh, blocks or uh, standard cells that we can actually iterate and simulate and carefully design. And then when you take that block, we uh, plug it in this behavioral or structural Verilog, and we, should, and we uh, run it through the uh, already automated uh, digital flow. Uh, these are a couple of designs, um, legacy design that we published at ICCC or VLSI or CICC, which are flagship conferences in the circuit uh, world. And we, we already taped out these, these chips and they are functional. And now what we did is we actually taped out using the automated framework. These are the auxiliary cells. So these auxiliary cells are very are key because you can vary the number of these cells within the design and you can get different performances. So for instance, the header cell and the inverter can be varied to get different, uh, uh, in the temp sensor, to get uh, different time conversion or re resolution or inaccuracy. That's, a, that's one example. The other example of the DC-DC converter, right? You can have switches with different sizes and different in parallel, so that gives you uh, different loads. Um, and that's very automated, so you, you get to have multiple designs generated at once. We also work with Intel and Minnesota to use their Align tool. And Align is a very, very custom, custom uh, layout generator. So um, when you give it a block like the LD or the DC-DC converter, you need to provide it with huge constraints which are very time consuming. So we identified it as a very cool tool to use it for these small blocks, the auxiliary cells, and to get the layout which looks like that on the left, which is really tiny, and you can iterate uh, a lot on these blocks. Now um, that I went through the flow, um, we, we were using FASOC as a main a framework, uh, using proprietary tools. So we are using Synopsys, Cadence, uh, Caliber, Spy Spectre. But then with the, the, uh, the initiative, open source initiative from Google and Skywater, uh, we had a bunch of tools. We already knew what OpenRoad was capable of. We were part of the team, so we, we used, used it really, really heavily. But there's a bunch of ec uh, tools and ecosystem, open source ecosystem that we, we have used, like Kiosis and ABC, and then the plugins from Sherlock and HD, UHDM that was released by um, Ant Micro and Google. Magic, NetGen, KLayout, and HGSpy. So we have the whole tool chain to get a chip. And this, this is the tool chain two years ago. So this has evolved tremendously. So FASOC, um, a lot of analog people are very, very um, curious how these things work. And I want to give you uh, a trade-off and examples of how we use it, how we can use the digital flow to get the design to work. So uh, I really like this figure here um, because it gives you, it summarizes where FASOC, which uses proprietary tools, uh, is today or uh, has been for the last two years. Uh, so if you take a full custom layout, which is all the way to the left with 100% complexity, and compare it uh, to the initial version of FASOC 1.0, uh, which started uh, four years ago, 
And it uses minimal, uh, minimal constraints without any custom placement or anything in place and route, then obviously the complexity goes way down. However, we can see that the performance takes a hit compared to high-end analog design. Now, when we swing back into the middle, um, when, uh, where we use partial constraints, and the digital compensation, compensation to address non-idealities, this still reduces complexity a lot compared to fully custom flows and tools. Um, and we gain back a lot of lost performance uh, in loosely constrained approaches, so we kind of get the best of both worlds. In fact, in using a cell-based approach here, uh, or the, our cell-based digital approach, we are in reality avoiding the extreme complexity of trying to take in all the PDK DRC rules uh, that comes in with full custom uh, automated layout, like routing or active layer drawing, uh, also with the rule of diminishing returns, the time required of porting the, to a new PDK or even a new design topology would essentially make an automated full custom analog generator too costly to make across PDKs and cases, design cases. So I think we have here a sweet point which I fundamentally believe we could push a little more to the left when we use, uh, when using open source tooling and software practices, and I will get to that later in this presentation. Here's a few examples. This is a DCO. Uh, we have fine cells and coarse, um, uh, coarse cells, and we have, this is a very, very sensitive block in a PLL. Uh, we use Python scripts to place them in a very structured manner, so this helps uh, bring in uh, the performance. Uh, the other cool example uh, is the digital LDO. We have, uh, if you take an and predict uh, um, uh, the FSOC bundle O, we have a really uh, random placement, and then uh, we ended up at postpex getting a very, very a low max uh, load current, but also high variability with the array size of the, um, the switches, right? Also due to the narrow routing and minimal via cuts. So, uh, so to address that, uh, when after uh, using a structured placement of the switches, uh, we improve a lot. We get back the smooth curve. We get prepex which uh, took, uh, you can see it at the top uh, on the right. So I'm going fast here because we have 20 minutes, um, but I'll share my slides and you can guys take a look, a closer look. Now I'll go uh, through some of the tape outs we did in open source, um, or IC contributions we did. In MPW1, uh, we did an array of time sensor using our um, um, digital approach to analog. Uh, these are 64 sensors. This was taped out in, in a month by a student. And we taped out um, uh, on the first shuttle. We also made an LDO, which is uh, sitting at the top. Um, and we made our, actually made with our own harness within the Caravel harness. We got the chips back. We tested them. Uh, we made different version of it. Uh, as I said, we have uh, auxiliary cells, so we can make a high density cell or a high speed cell. And you can see that you can gain density, but you can you have a, a really nice trade-off there or design space exploration. So any foundry is, in, uh, is really which would be very interested in getting this type of curves where they know exactly uh, or they offer um, um, a number of IPs that the customer can use, right, uh, based on resolution or time conversion or inaccuracy. Here's another um, a couple of curves from different sensors. These are measurements below one degree C, and it's published in the solid state uh, circuit letters uh, recently. So this was one of the, the first working chips using open source and fully open source tool chain. This is a comparison table. We compare, we are state of the art. We compare two papers from JSSCC or uh, CICC or ISSCC. Um, you can take a look at, at, the, at this uh, table, but the numbers are actually beating the state of the art or actually around them, the same numbers. And, um, and this is the die photo. Now on the second shuttle, we try to uh, step up our game. Uh, in Michigan, we usually do low power SOCs. So we started working on Open Titan, which is a root of trust. And we, uh, we taped out an array of digital LDOs the same way we taped out a sen the sensors. Um, and we also came up with a couple um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a couple of features in the flow, like the ECO flow, to help fix, it, fix the uh, hold violations. 
Uh, this is a couple features. I just wanted to show you what the open source uh, tools are capable of. These are two voltage domains uh, that are used in the temp sensor. Uh, again, I'll go fast since we are uh, 13 minutes. This is the digital LDO with its pipe encoding. We added a voltage reference for uh, variability, uh, temperature variability, or variations, and this is the, the array of temp sensors. Uh, this was all integrated with an SOC, or the root of trust, um, and this was one of the first AMS uh, digital block, or AMS uh, SOCs taped out in the open source world. We hope it, this is gonna be working. We also made up a tool, uh, tool um, um, a flow for ECO for whole violation fixing. That was this is a main issue we can see in Caravel right now. So we were aware of the issue at the time. We also taped out recently on MPW6 um, another root of trust based on the pulp platform. And this is the ECO flow. We basically this is a very simple flow. Uh, it's basically inserting the buffers for all the paths after the flow is uh, after the you get your final def, you're basically going on a heuristic loop where you insert the buffer so you can fix hold. So this is very useful because the tools might not be as mature uh, for some of the test cases. So you have to be very, very aware of what needs to be done to get your design to work post silicon. Uh, I'm happy to discuss that after the, uh, the, uh, the presentation. The cool thing about the open source tools is that you can go and make your own functions so that you can do uh, specific physical design features like stacked voltage domains or vol you know, two voltage domains and etc. cetera. So uh, this was, we started this work two years ago with my students and we made a voltage domain. Now it's much more fleshed out with Peter Gatford's work on the UPF flow. But this is exciting to see and you guys can go and check the source code and make your own uh, features. Another exciting project is the GF12 tape out we did. This is one of the first open source tape out, uh, uh, FinFET tape outs using Open Road. We made another route of trust. We hit 350 megahertz at normal conditions, and the temp sensor is actually better because the FinFET fits with the digital flow. Uh, we also right now working on Intel 16 tape out of another route of trust with another, other features, and uh, we'll tape it out at the end of this month. Another cool project is the work we're doing with NIST. Um, so I'll go fast here. Basically, this is for quantum applications. We need cryogenic models so we can tape out or you can uh, design a chip that controls the quantum processor. So you need a control system. And th that control system needs to run at 4K, right, for uh, obvious reasons, because the, the quantum processor is running at uh, below 100 milli K. All right, so I have got to go fast here. This is... Um, this is a couple of chip we uh, made. Uh, this is the first chip we did with NIST. This was done in December. And um, uh, basically, there's a couple of test structures there. So we can make models at cryogenic temperatures. There's over, uh, mask upper rays, line resistance, VR resistance. Why am I? Uh, OK, we made other ring oscillators. Uh, we used open road for that. This is uh, fully automated. It has an interleaved placement. Uh, with bare pads and all, uh, we made 24 version of it using all the standard cells and the flavors in this Discover 130 technology, and this was done in two months, by the way. Um, this is other structures, and the reason I'm showing you this is that, is the reason behind that is that we're, we're evolving, the OpenFA SOC flow is evolving and using much more customized uh, placement and routing using a tool called GDS Factory. So this is an example where we made a routine or an API that takes the, the layers, the pitches, uh, and dimensions, and it dumps um, uh, an array of meme caps, which can be used for flying caps. This is very useful for analog blocks. So we, when you use that, you can reuse it for diode arrays, different applications. So this was very, very uh, interesting in our projects because we started doing things differently and recycling APIs that can be used for different things. So this, the same APIs was used to place everything together with the bare parts here. And you can see here with different structures like diodes, main caps. So these are simple structures, but um, we actually worked on this. And we got a, uh, a result, resultant die of 1,400 pads, 400, 400 uh, transistors, it's a, you can see it there. And this, was, this work was done with uh, NIST, ADS from Israel, and CoolCAD. Over the, the tape outs, so this was done in MPW5. We did MPW6 and MPW7. These are every three months. 
So we, every three months, we were ab able to concoct a tape out. And as you can see, the, the structures inside each of the tape out is getting much more complex. So the th there is a lot of uh, usefulness in using OpenFA SOC. When you get the hang of it, you will be able to do much more than this. And uh, my students are getting very, very conf confident with it, and we'll probably see much more complex structures in APW8. Uh, I just want to note that these projects are now, there's much more people included. There's GW, uh, there's Brown, um, and other people. Um, oh, uh, I just want to note here, this, is, this was done by high school students. Ryan Wands from uh, Maryland reached out to me a year ago and said, hey, I want to do design. That was really interesting to me because I work with grad students. So I wasn't really s sure about how to, you know, how seriously this should be. Uh, so after, after a couple months, I realized the student was serious. And, you know, um, with the open source community, you learn much more quicker. So the student uh, started learning a lot. And he made his own VCO that runs at 2.4 gigahertz. And he's one of the the first people doing this in the open source community. Uh, I mean, I think there's much more complex designs, but this is really, really interesting to see that a high school student is able to do this design that normally grad students would be working on. So this is really exciting to me. Um, he did actually the full analysis. He used all the open source tools available. This tool chain is still under construction, so it's very hard to, make, to, to use. But he was able to design another 10 gigahertz oscillator, and we're going to use this for a quantum current standard uh, structure that we're taping out with NIST. Um, this is another. Um, yeah, so, um, OK, I have a minute, I think. So basically, this is our framework. Uh, it started with the green uh, boxes. It was a digital flow. Now we have APIs that call GDS factory and uh, K layout. So it's a much more elaborative, elaborated framework we are, we, where we encourage reuse and recycling of APIs. So with the open source community, everyone, there's a lot of software people um, trying to do design. So we can re, uh, reuse their practices to improve or um, uh, re, re, um, make a revolution in the way we do hardware or do hardware in the software style. Uh, I'll finish with this slide here. Um, I'm coming back to the initial uh, diagram I showed you, uh, and the idea here is to show you that with the uh, open source tools, there, there is an increased automation. So OpenFA SOC is actually not um, is is actually um, a step um, above the FASOC.10 because we are able to do now customized layout and routing and PDN gen and all using tools like GDS Factory or Magic or Align, and calling different APIs. So. Um, you know, this is exciting to see, and I think maybe open source is going to be the reason automated analog is going to be possible in the future. But um, yeah, this is the this was my talk. I have a couple other slides um, on uh, on uh, on what we're doing at this SSES uh, uh, Society with uh, Boris Merman from Stanford. But there's a chipathon that runs for six months, and there's people from all over the place uh, joining. So I would encourage people here in um, in Japan to join us. And there's a competition right now called the Coda Chip, which is a notebook competition. Uh, and uh, it's all Python based, and it's a tribal grant competition at the ISSCC um, conference, which is the flagship conference. And it's really good for students to visit if they can make their own notebook. And I'll end my talk here. I think it's. <laughs> Thank you, Mehdi. So uh, it's very interesting talk. So, so uh, questions, please. please. Oh, did you say uh, training cell is uh, the you collaborate with uh, uh, automation uh, kind of layout generator to to make an uh, other primitive analog cell? Is that right? Yes. So sure. it means uh, Intel also agreed to use in such kind of a generator in open space. What, what is it? Sorry. Uh, so Intel. Intel. Intel allowed to use uh, that kind of tool in open space. Oh. Or just provided you know, generated, you know, the cell is open. All right. So you're talking about the Intel 16 tape? Yeah. Well, I mean, I can talk for Intel, right? But the idea, Intel is very interested in open source. That I know for sure. Um, our tape is not going to be available on mm. on on um, on GitHub. Mm. 
Maybe it's going to be, I heard they, they are interested in open sourcing their PDK, uh, but, you know, um, the, appro the, the framework is on GitHub. You know, if you make an API uh, that actually takes the metal layers and uh, it can be standardized to be used across different technologies. So that's very useful to us because we can use it in 16 nanometer, DF12, and Sky 130 with some small adaptation. So that's the way we're trying to do analog, where um, we, know, we encourage uh, students to document their functions and make scalable functions. Uh, one thing I want to add here, that's a good point, in, in FinFET, the layout is very painful, mm -hmm. analog layout, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is data-driven optimization of analog layout. So mm -hmm. generate thousands or hundreds of thousands of designs, and with uh, some genetic model, be able to select which designs are good, right? So these are interesting projects that we'll probably see in the so future. So that means uh, that kind of tool is just for the FinFET process? Oh. I wouldn't say it's only for FinFET. Mm. It's it should be scalable across scalable. technology. So our framework is supposed to be uh, scalable across different <coughs> test cases or PDKs. Thank you. Next question. Thank you for very interesting talk. Uh, I am very impressed that uh, your tool generates uh, almost. Uh, uh, the layout almost automatically, but are there any uh, DLC errors or some kind of errors in the layout? So mm. that's, uh, that's a good point. Mm. Uh, these are open source tools, right? Mm. So um, the good thing or bad thing at the same time mm -hmm. is that the student has to go and check the source code of mm. Open Road or GDS Factory ah. to do something. Mm. But over time, as you can mm. see, this is a tape out every three months. Right? Mm -hmm. and these are three tape outs in Skywater. We're mm. doing an Intel 16 nanometer tape out, and mm. we are doing other SOCs mm. that I didn't show there. Mm. So these are done by five students. You saw the, my, mm -hmm. my group, right? It's not mm. a huge group. And we're able to crank up all these designs, so it's possible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, <laughs> so it's, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, it's because the uh, era problem is not so serious, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, okay, good. Yeah, uh, yeah but there, uh, I think that your layouts are very beautiful. Uh, that it means that uh, it cannot be generated automatically, I think. So maybe uh, handmade for planning and uh, some kind of direction to the, the layout was done by students. Is okay. it right? Um, I didn't mm. get the question, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, actually, the, the layout you showed uh, is very beautiful. So the, it, uh, I can't uh, believe that it, all of them was generated. Automatically. Oh, they are, they are so, uh, uh, so uh, GDS Factory is a uh, photonics tool. And photo if you know photonics, mm. there's a lot of routing, mm -hmm. which is very customized. So what mm. we, uh, Joachim from Google, actually mm. introduced us to this tool. Mm. And he's using all Python to write uh, mm -hmm. a layout. And he's mm. making this huge phase mm. array mm -hmm. uh, blocks. So we actually reuse the same, same thing. And that's what mm. I'm saying, in the open source world, mm. you can reuse practices mm. from software people. Mm -hmm. That, mm. uh, you know, hardware is very, mm. very uh, uh, rudimentary in terms mm. of their mm. software practices. Mm. So in the open source world, mm. using this all, uh, you know, these um, approaches, you mm. know, like GitHub actions mm. or mm. CIs, these are very useful. Okay, yeah. okay. So uh, what I'm saying here mm. is that all of this is automated. Mm. Uh, routing is automated. When you make a new mm. design, like mm. let's say you're making an ADC mm. and you have a CDAC, mm. Uh, you might have to do some work to, mm. to get it the, site, the right floor planning, mm. but then you get a generator that can generate uh, thousands of versions of mm. that uh, CDAP, right? Mm. So that's the powerful mm. part of it. Okay, yeah. okay, I got it. Thank, Thank you very much. Please. Yeah, I wanted to add that um, the, the, the whole chip layout is not generated like the, the actual like uh, block are. And then I think it's always like he wanted also to know if like the full kind of things that you tap out itself, like you have many blocks that are generated here, but you you lay, you lay them out manually next to each other, right? Uh, like uh, say like for when you show like the for example the OpenFSO tap out. Sure, which one of them? Uh, for the last one, for example, MPW five or oh. six or seven. Yeah. So. 
we're talking, talking about yeah this, so right? yeah and so for example the pme block will be generated like the vco will be generated yeah. like the, and then you will like kind of yeah, lay yeah, yeah. them the money yeah. next to each other block. this yeah. is not the whole thing generated by yeah itself. yeah so yeah. i think you just want to oh okay, okay. Yeah, we still have four minutes. Yeah. I thank, thank you for the nice talk. talk. I have a one question uh, regarding the, this layered image of MPW number, number seven. Uh -huh. So uh, I think this pattern is dedicated to the PDK development for cryogenic, com uh, cryogenic uh, computing applications. I think this pattern is for the CMOS uh, to de uh, develop the PDK Correct. pattern, right? Well, um, all right. The first one, MPW5, is actually a test uh, structure die. Mm -hmm. So this is for modeling a standard temperature or cryogenic temperature. It, with the nanofabrication project, I didn't have time to go into details, but the nanofabrication project is mm -hmm. meant to um, allow people to do much more things mm -hmm. with devices yes, yes. and test them. And this, done is, uh, this work is done with Nest and Brian Hoskins, who is a great physicist, and we work with him every week on developing structures mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. like the quantum current standard yeah, or CV yes. measurements, uh, which are very useful for uh, single defect detection, current sources, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So for MPW7, the TIAs or TAs are supposed to run at cryogenic temperatures, but yeah. the VCO is actually a building block for the quantum current yes, standard yes. Mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. So one other thing I want to say here is this is an iterative process, and this is a software approach where you don't do a one tape out and you're done. You're actually doing uh, multiple iterations of your block, like you're compiling a code. Yeah. And uh, the VCO is going to be a building block for the quantum current yes, standard, yes. which it has ADCs and stuff like that. So, you know, um, these, these, uh, these blocks that are really simple, like the MOS arrays, yes. these blocks that are much more complicated, like photodiodes and stuff like that. Oh, thank so, you. I'm from Compact Modeling Society. I'm, a, I'm from a Compact Modeling Engineering so they, oh. you know, community. So now currently, uh, the existing compact model, CMOS compact model, is not able to uh, re reproduce the cryogenic temperature behavior like you know, DC and GM. So I think in this point of view, you have to uh, develop your own compact model to design this kind of applications. Do you have any kind of uh, planning or to, to uh, research and development activities for the cryo uh, for compact model to speed with the cryo modeling? Cryo Cryogenic CMOS uh, applications. Yeah, um, this is a this is a good point. Actually, we should talk after the meeting here. Uh, yeah. But we're we're running this uh, on our working group, and there has been a couple talks from Christian Enns from EPFL. Uh, Christian, yes, uh, I know him very, very well. Yes. Yeah. So uh, these are but NIST is supposed to create these models. Yeah. Coolcad Akin is supposed to mm -hmm. generate these models, and this is the first step: making the test structures. Then he's going to make the measurements create uh, the parameters to create the model. There's different talks about EKV models, yeah. Verilog A. Uh, you mean SEKV, right? Uh, SEKV, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, everyone likes their own model. Uh, I'm not uh, an expert in modeling. Uh, I'm basically creating the test structure for these guys to uh -huh. create uh -huh. the model. But I think with the open source, uh, we're trying to create a standard for all, for all of this. Uh -huh. And I, I think it's, it's worth having your opinion on that. Uh, since you're an expert in, in the field. Yeah, I'm very glad to hear to talk sure. with you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, is it okay? Yeah. No. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Mariana-san. Uh, Mariana-san.